All right, today we're going to dive into a little bit of the macro aspect, not only on the market side of things, take a look at maybe how the FOMC could be affecting scenarios playing out within the market in the next few months. And then we'll wrap up with uh, something around the ordinal space in uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. We'll di dive into all that good stuff for you. I think you're going to love it. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Joining me today is Peter Schiff. He's been on our show before, but I want to welcome him back into the show. So great to see you. Uh, thanks, Paul, for inviting me back on your, your program. Yeah, excellent. If you guys have not followed Peter, uh, one of the things you can do is just go over to Shift Radio. It's very simple. Uh, just hit shiftradio.com. You'll get a chance to catch all of his podcasts. You can learn a lot around what he's doing and talking about in terms of appearances, books, all that kind of stuff. But obviously, I think you guys all know uh, Peter mainly because of his, um, his bullishness on gold. Speaking of that, Peter, we're going to jump to the first thing, and I want to really get into a couple of scenarios from a macro standpoint. If you look at the, the history of what Powell has done with raising rates and the speed in which he's done it, obviously crushing pretty much yield curves and, and the bond market in that process, and you look at that process over the last 18 months, this of course was an article back in December of 2021 when all of this began. Now we're getting to a pause with what the Fed's uh, funds rates are going to be, even though now we could see a possible 25 basis points in the next meeting. What was your take, first of all, on Chair Powell and maybe their strategy going into the summer? Well, I kind of think the Fed is, is done, at least for the time being. I, I don't believe that they're gonna follow through with the additional rate hikes that they're, you know, they're forecasting between now and the end of the year. I think they paused for a reason. I think if they really were committed to continuing the inflation fight, they wouldn't have paused. They would just raise rates because they've admitted that they're still not high enough and inflation is a bigger problem than they thought. Uh, mm -hmm. So why pause? I think the reason is because they're also paying attention to the damage that higher rates are doing to the real economy and in particular to the, the banks and the financial system. Uh, and, and so I think they don't want to put any added pressure on such a fragile situation. So they stopped hiking. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to matter. I think that just leaving rates where they are is too big a burden for the system to handle. And you have to keep in mind that rates are not high. 5% historically is low. I mean, if you go back to the, you know, the era where we've been on fiat money, go back to 1971 sure. and where have the Fed funds rates been, five is not is not high. It's only high in relation to where we've been for the last you know 14 years or so uh, in yeah. this unprecedented period of monetary excess. But we now have the highest inflation since the 1970s, yet interest rates are nowhere near where they were back then. So they've got a long way to go up, but of course the Fed can't let them go up, which means inflation is what's gonna go way up. That's why mm -hmm. I'm so bearish on, I mean bullish on gold because I'm very bearish on the dollar. All right. So a couple of things playing out on this, because you, you mentioned, obviously, the strategy that Powell has taken, uh, both on the approach of not necessarily looking at additional rate raises. Y you look back at his acceleration, because it's really all about speed in which they got to 5%. It pretty much wrecked the bond market. Obviously, we saw flights of capital go into money markets. I mean, does that not look like pretty much a rug pull on the banking system at the speed in which they did this? Yeah, I mean, certainly people, the bankers didn't anticipate that the Fed would be this aggressive. In fact, early on, I didn't think they'd do it either. I, I didn't even think they can get away with it. I thought that pulling the rug out from under the economy you know, would topple it faster. Uh, so I was kind of surprised that they were able to get rates to 5% without more damage. Now, of course, mm -hmm. we got that damage and they backstopped it. We had Silicon Valley Bank, right. Signature Bank, you know, these, these massive failures. And there would have been way more had the government not come to the rescue. It already would have been a much bigger financial crisis than 08. Now, all they've done really is been able to you know, hold it off. You know, but the, the, the momentum is building as rates stay where they are and more and more you know, low yielding debt matures in a mm -hmm. higher rate environment. But the pressure continues to mount on the banks 
because the value of their collateral has, is collapsing. Uh, you know, the, not only the, the treasuries and mortgage back, but their commercial loan books are imploding. Yeah. And they're losing their deposits because their customers are taking their money back because they sure. can buy a money market fund and get 5%. They're still paying zero on checking. You get maybe a quarter of a percent at most on savings accounts. Yeah, you can get a couple of percent if you, you buy a CD, but why lock your money up for three or five years when you exactly. can get more just putting it in a money market and getting a checkbook? You know, you can get money market checking, you know, at, at a brokerage firm mm -hmm. and, and get 5% on your money. All right, so Peter, you, your theory is that we're gonna continue to see some more str struggles here within the banking system, obviously with these rates and the trailing factors that are gonna be p piling into this, including debt, including the economy around jobs, what we'll see in the commercial real estate sector, maybe even in the consumer debt side of things, uh, it, at least all of that now piling in. Pa or the pause from Powell yesterday, the, the Powell pause, do you think that sticks throughout the end of the year or do you think they'll still have to pick up another? And the last part of that question is, do you think inflation starts to re-energize much like what happened in Canada? Yeah, well, first of all, I think the pause is, is, is going to be here for a while. I think they pause for a reason. They don't really want to hike, but they don't want to say that. So they have to pretend they're ready to hike more, but don't actually hike more. Right. Now, Maybe they're hoping that the inflation numbers really come down so that they have a justification for not hiking more. Or uh, maybe the economic uh, numbers weaken, which that's more likely. It's more likely that we see weaker economic numbers, maybe a pickup in uh, unemployment or uh, a, a decline in the, you know, the non-farm payroll reports. The economic data that's coming out and you know, look at all the data that came out today the unemployment claims uh very weak much much greater than expected we uh, philly fed uh was worse than expected the uh industrial production capacity utilization worse than expected all negative right. I mean, we're getting negative number after negative number so i mean we're this is stagflation i mean there's no question yes. the yes. economy is weak the only thing that you know powell is pointing to that he claims is strong is the labor market. And I think there, you know, he's missing some clear signs that there's a lot of weakness in the labor market that he doesn't just recognize. All right. So a couple of things here I wanted to showcase here. And this is, of course, kind of playing to your uh, to your book a little bit. Central Bank gold demand hit its first quarter record. This was back in May. This was May 5th article from CNBC. You see that kind of track, and then you also look at just gold price right near. Obviously, that was kind of somewhat uh, on that prediction of what we saw when you look at the performance right here on this dip right here from February to where we're performing right now. Gold still hovering around 2000. Do you feel like central banks will continue to pile into the gold bandwagon here? Yeah, in fact, they're not even piling in yet. They're buying, but I think they're going to be picking up the pace once the price of gold really starts to go up. I mean, maybe right now they feel they can go slower and, you know, they're taking advantage of the fact that the price has been relatively stable. It is a bit surprising that it hasn't already moved up given what's going on. I think right. that's causing some people to kind of doubt that it's ever going to move up because they'll say, well, if it can't move up given the circumstances, it'll never move up. Well, that's mm -hmm. just not true. It's just, it's just taking time. Remember, I think the big headwind that gold has faced, one was the strong dollar, uh, and the dollar is, you know, surrendering that strength now. It hasn't broken down yet. I believe it, it, it soon will. It's having a very weak day today. Uh, but also, the, the markets still believe the Fed. They still believe Powell when he says he's committed to doing whatever it takes to bring inflation down to 2%, no matter how high rates have to go, no matter how long they have to stay there. And that has been a headwind for gold. But what's optimistic is that even with the expectation of you know this higher for longer, gold has not gone down. It hasn't gone up, yeah. it hasn't sold off either. It's kind of holding its own. But I think eventually the markets are gonna realize that this is all bluff, that Powell really doesn't have the cojones to fight inflation when that fight causes 
severe collateral damage to the economy, to the banking system. I mean, in his Q&A yesterday, he said that he's never going to tell Congress to stop spending or stop the deficits. He said that's none of his business. Fiscal mm-hmm. policy isn't any of his concern. Well, that means he's going to have to monetize all those deficits that he refuses to criticize, which are skyrocketing. Yeah. There's going to be tremendous pressure on the Fed to create inflation, not to fight inflation. And so when the markets realize that the Fed is not going to be victorious in this fight against inflation, it's going to surrender. Inflation is going to win. Gold is going to go ballistic, you know. Uh, and, you know, so I just you know feel that, you know, I'm willing to wait it out because I, I know how much it's going to go up when it finally moves. And I'd rather own it now and wait than have to scramble to buy it later at a much higher price. Yeah. I mean, obviously, with uh, the Dixie, I was looking at this performance right here. If you go all the way back down to 2021, which was really some of the the lower uh, components of where the dollar was holding, as to as opposed to where we are today, right at 102.17. Um, I mean, do you feel like that you're saying that this could accelerate faster and we could see the 2021 type dip again when you look at this or even further uh, cuts in terms of the dollar? Well, no, I think it's going to fall precipitously. I mean, you really have a perfect storm right now of destruction for the dollar mm-hmm. because the, the, the Fed tightening cycle is coming to an end. And and so that's been the, the tailwind for the dollar. It's now uh, going to be a headwind. I mean, it's going to be weakening the dollar. But you also have this unprecedented movement now around the world to de-dollarize. Uh, yep. You know, countries that were significant buyers of dollars and then U.S. Treasuries are now sellers. You know, China obviously doesn't want our dollars and it doesn't want to buy new dollars. It wants to get rid of dollars it owns. Same thing, you know, clearly Russia, you know, is not a dollar buyer anymore. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, doesn't appear uh, to want dollars anymore. Brazil, uh, India, uh, you got major uh, exporting countries uh, that have huge dollar surpluses in their you know trade and uh, large dollar reserves in their in their holdings that want to unload. Uh, and so this is going to put tremendous pressure on the dollar at a time where our budget deficits and our trade deficits are in record territory. We've got trillion dollar a year trade deficits, two trillion dollar a year budget deficits. Uh, we're you know there's no place for those three trillion dollars to go, you know uh, and. and so th- this is massive inflation because, you know, for years and years, America exported its inflation. We printed money and sent it out to places like China. They used the money to buy treasuries, which kept our rates low. And then they shipped us goods that they produced, which kept consumer prices low. Right. Now we're going to import that inflation back because now the Chinese aren't going to want to buy these dollars. And so they're they're and they're, and therefore Chinese goods are going to be more expensive. We're not going to buy as much stuff, so our prices are going to go up. And now the Chinese are going to take those dollars that they used to hold in treasuries, and they're going to come shopping in America to buy our stuff. And right. a lot of it isn't right. going to be the new stuff that we make, but it's going to be the old stuff that we already own. So it's like a giant repossession. But all this money is going to come in, and prices are going to go you know, ballistic. The one that worries me is India, because this is one, it's a very innovative country. There's massive population growth, and it's most likely going to end up on the positive side from a demographic standpoint. You know, even in the last month, you know, India, of course, was a net seller of U.S. dollars. There are 25 billion in the spot market here, just not only 30 days ago. So I I would agree, yes, there's some scenarios that are playing into that. One other tweet that I want to hit on here, this was from TED Talks Macro. A couple of things he hits on here that I thought was interesting, the Fed revising their dot plot, because and this is getting to a question for you, uh, from a 5.1 to 5.6, uh, six, uh, Fed projection for GDP growth and employment are now more optimistic, which is kind of counterbalancing that. My question is to you is, if the Fed cannot get inflation under control, how can Powell walk this back? Because he has been so adamant to get to this 2%. How would he walk this back ever? Well, well, all, well, one thing he just needs is some bigger problem in the banking sector, bigger problem in commercial real estate, uh, some cracks in the labor market. Uh, that might give him the cover to say, oh, wait a minute, these conditions are now setting the stage for a decline in inflation. Even if we haven't seen that decline yet, 
you know, he still has this Keynesian view that inflation is a byproduct of economic growth and employment. So if the Fed has a less optimistic view on the economy and realizes that the labor market is cooling, then, you know, based on that view, the Fed would be justified in saying, look, we're just going to hold our fire for a while because, you know, we think inflation may start coming down. Now, that's yeah. not true. Inflation has got nothing to do with those things. In fact, if anything, it's the reverse. The Fed creates inflation when it prints money and it printed a whole lot of money over the last uh, decade or so. And that's why we're seeing prices going up. Sure. Sure. Yeah. This was kind of back to your point here, pal. The statement of 51 trillion in debt by 2030 gets back to your point of Certain assets are definitely going to start to see some acceleration. Obviously, I hold both Bitcoin and gold. Those are the two horses I'm betting on for the future, especially against the U.S. dollar. And when you look at that kind of acceleration, because that's a, I mean, listen, that's seven years from now. That's another 20 trillion in debt in seven yeah. years. And that's probably underscoring this number, most likely, yeah, if well, we get to that number. Yeah, what are your well, thoughts on the you future here? <laughs> Well, hopefully you got more money in gold than, than Bitcoin because that horse is going to end up in the glue factory. Nope, uh, you know, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. Not in, yeah, but, not in the but, winter circle with, 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 with gold. You know, it's not even going to place or show. You know, it's not even. I know. I love, you know, we, we, we love to have these bantering back in points. I do own gold, but I own a lot of Bitcoin as well. Still my number one asset. Uh, fear and greed. Right now, extreme, extreme greed. Stock market uh, is, is looking at this and some stocks actually been licking their chops. Uh, great performance over the last few months. How long can this hold up, Peter, before we start to see some yeah. traditional well, finance, like, especially on Wall Street? A lot of it is, it's the, you know, AI uh, mania. And, sure. you know, and, and obviously AI looks like it's, it, it, it is real. I mean, it's, it, it has the potential to dramatically increase productivity, which is a good thing for everybody. But, you know, the way the government finances work in the short run and the way our politicians react, it actually is going to be a negative because, you know, when, when companies replace their workers with AI, those workers are no longer paying taxes to the government. Uh, but the companies still get to deduct the cost of all that, you know, equipment. But, you know, when they're paying workers, the workers are paying payroll taxes, they're paying income taxes, they're not going to get that money anymore. And a lot of those workers are just going to stay unemployed for a while. They're going to collect more government benefits. So this means uh, more money printing. So even though we get greater efficiencies from AI, I think that will be offset by extra inflation, by more money printing and bigger deficits. So in the short run, uh, th that's going to that's going to be a problem. And of course, the other thing with AI is when you don't need workers, you don't need as much uh, office space. And that yeah. just makes it even worse for the commercial office sector and yeah. the banks. Uh, and, and so, they're, they're, you know, but I think some of these stocks, obviously, like NVIDIA, I mean, you know, that's the go to stock. So everybody's Unity. piling in there. But, you know, look at Microsoft keeps hitting new all time record highs. So, yep. you know, there's there's a narrow group of companies. But ultimately, AI has to benefit all the companies that implement it, not just, you know, a handful of of, of tech companies. But, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be a get out of jail free card for American debt. You know, I think that we still have a day of reckoning. This doesn't you know, get us out of that jail uh, because our economy can now grow so fast that we can we can handle all this debt uh, that, that that's not going to happen. Um, but I do think that the tech market is is way overdone. I think it's, it's going to break. I think what's interesting here for you, for you and your Bitcoin is Bitcoin has not participated in this explosion in tech. I mean, for a long time, Bitcoin was very highly correlated with the NASDAQ and, the, and these types of stocks. But you've seen this big move up in tech and Bitcoin has actually gone down. I mean, Bitcoin, as we're speaking, is right, you know, right around 25,000, actually a little bit below the 25,000 handle. So it is, you know, it is ignoring all the speculative money that's flowing into tech. It's not flowing into Bitcoin. Now, some people might think, oh, OK, well, it's correlated with gold now. Well, I mean, it's like people like to say it's correlated with, with whatever you know happens to be going up. But gold's been going sideways and so is Bitcoin, although Bitcoin's actually gone down, not just sideways. 
gold's really gone gone sideways. But I think it'll be interesting to see what happens if we do get a big breakout in gold. Gold takes out 2,000, maybe 2,100, 2,200, yeah. and really starts to go. Yet Bitcoin continues to fall. And so if Bitcoin breaks its correlation with tech and then it has no correlation with gold, then, you know, what the hell is it? What, why do people own it, right? So th this is going to be, I think, a, a, a big uh, moment here uh, for, for, for Bitcoin, you know. And yeah, so at least I if would you're agree. Buying, take Bitcoin and buy some gold, at least you yep. could use it to buy one of my ordinals. Because, you know, <laughs> if you like Bitcoin because it's scarce, you know, there's 21 quadrillion Satoshis. There's only 50 of these original Peter Schiff ordinals. So there's a lot we're, more. We're going to talk about there. those. We're going to talk about those. Ba back to your point early, you know, in being able to, from a productivity standpoint, kind of work our way out of this from a debt aspect. And, you know, if you think about what Raul Powell s says, I know you guys kind of go back and forth, but his, his big angle is productivity wins the race, AI most likely, blockchain, those are the two technologies that most likely will be helpful in that area. Now, can it be enough to save what we have here in the United States from the aspect of, you know, just growth and being able to keep up with essentially the debt structure that's going into place. What do you, with that being said, what do you make of this tweet right here, which is where you've got Bank of America and also BlackRock starting to push into Bitcoin at higher percentages. Is this something that you feel like they're just looking at diversification or what is your opinion on that? Well, I'm not familiar with the fact that, you know, they're uh, increasing exposure to Bitcoin. I don't even know what exposure they have to Bitcoin. I would imagine that it's very tiny if they have it. Six point uh, two you know, and two point three. Excuse me. Six point two percent and two point three is what they're currently holding for BlackRock of what? and Bank. Percent of what? So banks publicly. So the the tweet basically says strategic Bitcoin reserves for BlackRock and Bank of America both have been up. So they have changed here in terms of overall value. What do you mean? I mean, if, if anybody's investing in this, including some of those kinds of companies, is that just diversification or is there something else here? I don't know. I think that's just something foolish that they'll regret. You know, I think, uh, you know, they're going to lose money if they're actually, you know, buying Bitcoin. Now, you know, does that mean that Bitcoin can't go up? I mean, it could. Sure. I mean, if people are dumb enough to buy it, it'll go up. The problem is there's not as many dummies left to buy it. They already own it. And the dummies that do own it, <laughs> you know, they need the money. They want to get out. You know, I mean, well, I, money isn't I, I, anymore. You so know, I, I would I, not I say, um, uh, I would say I'm not a dummy. Okay. But, and I own it. <laughs> well, okay. So that's just one thing. I won't take that as a personal You know, offense. it's a greater I understand. Here, but. <laughs> I understand. All right. So here's another tweet right here. Investment giant BlackRock is close to fi <laughs> filing an application for a Bitcoin ETF. Is that, what do you think about that? What if they were to do that? Wouldn't that show faith in, in the Bitcoin market? Well, we already have Bitcoin ETFs, you know, sure. uh, outside the United States. And then yep. you've got, mm -hmm. you know, that, that big grayscale thing. It's a little different Bitcoin when it's BlackRock. Ethereum. Yeah, it's a little different when it's yeah, BlackRock. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't see, look, maybe BlackRock thinks they can make a little money off of people's willingness to buy Bitcoin. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. But, you know, these guys aren't infallible. It's not like they've, they've, they've you know, they've, they've never done something that was wrong. But again... If they if they launch a Bitcoin ETF, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they believe in it. It just means that they think there are enough other people who believe in it and they mm -hmm. want to make money off of them. It's like you, you can open up a casino, but not be a gambler yourself. So I don't have to go and gamble at my casino. I could just collect the winnings from everybody else who is totally get yeah, enough. totally get that for sure. It is one, uh, obviously the, you know, the scenario of wanting to look good in the, the national stage and the world stage, you know, from BlackRock standpoint, I think is important. Back to your point, gold versus Bitcoin. This is showing the gold versus Bitcoin chart. And there is a lot of correlation here if you just look at the chart in general. Uh, and that's a chart going all the way back into, you know, December of last year, uh, moving into where we are right now uh, with Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin slightly down, gold slightly sideways. Uh, within that. So you, I, I understand your position still holding strong. Uh, within that, I want to jump over to the topic of ordinals because I know you have a, a project getting ready to, to link up here. 
Uh, but 12 million inscriptions to date, it is a little bit down in terms of trends, up overall, but down in terms of trends. When you look at that and what you guys are doing with the Golden Triumph, right? Is that right? It's the Golden Triumph? That's the name of the, that's the, name of the painting, right? Okay, so the way this works, explain to me a little bit about uh, the Golden Triumph itself. Let's go over and click, we'll click on that right there to show you. All right, so this yeah, is our project. And, and so yep. That's the, so that is actually a, a digital depiction of a actual painting. It's an oil on linen painting. Okay. Uh, that an artist friend of mine, neighbor down in Puerto Rico painted for me, you know, I uh, guess I'm, you know, I'm a gold guy and he's a Bitcoin yep. guy from, from way back. Sure. And, and so he happens to be in New York uh, this month. He's got, he rented out a gallery on Madison Avenue in the city where he is you know, displaying his work. And I've gone to some of his shows. You know, I went to, you know, Art Basel. I saw his stuff in Miami and, okay. you know, I, I like his stuff, you know, and he has, he has a lot of uh, people who collect his stuff, who buy his stuff. It's mm -hmm. very, you know, very masculine art in general. Uh, but, but, but it's very interesting and, and, and imaginative and he's a, he's a talented artist, but, you know, just like you, he's, you know, total Bitcoin guy. And, uh, but, but, you know, we're friends. I have a lot of Bitcoin friends and neighbors down in, in Puerto Rico. Um, not sure how much longer they'll be able to afford to live there, but they're there now. <laughs> but any event, um, so he's going to be down there at this gallery and he told me about ordinals. I didn't know about him. I thought, oh, it's interesting, you know. And we had the idea of, you know, why don't I, why don't we sell this painting? Why don't we make an ordinal of this painting? Mm -hmm. So you can buy the painting and get the ordinal. But in this case, the ordinal app actually represents ownership of something physical, something tangible, a, a piece of art that you can hang on your wall and, you know, admire, be proud of. It's a possession. It's original. It's going to be signed by the artist and you. And, you know, he may be famous one day. I'm, you know, somewhat famous now. I may be more famous in the future. So who knows what this painting would be? But also, you know, to enable more people to get something, we decided on making some prints, some original uh, numbered prints. So we're coming out with 50, you yep. know, quality prints that I'm going to sign and he's going to sign. In fact, we're going to sign them live tomorrow in New York City at that gallery on Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. You can get the address down there. I mean, so if you want to come by, even if you don't want to buy a print, you can come down, see the art, meet me, meet Mark. Um, but there's going to be 50 of these ordinals that are going to be sold. And they're going to correspond to 50 numbered prints. So 50 people will be able to get a print. One person will have the original oil painting and everybody will get an ordinal that, you know, will represent ownership. But, you know, the ordinals can be traded. People could sell the ordinal and keep the print. They could keep them together, which I think would maximize the value of the ordinal if it went along with the print, um, because it really evidences the history, the history of the ownership. And it authenticates that if you go to sell that print, that it's actually the original print. It's not some knockoff that you just had somebody made. It's the one that I actually signed. Um, so who knows, you know, and the people who are buying them, you know, we're not we don't have any kind of stake in them. I mean, once you buy the ordinal and the print, you own it. You know, you can sell it. I mean, it's not like there's any kind of smart contract in there where right. you know, I benefit somehow if somebody sells it at a profit. I have no idea what these things will be worth. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that they're worth something because it's an actual uh, painting or an actual print that is going to be signed. And, and, you know, and so it's scarce as an original. Um, I like the way it looks. You know, if you're a gold bug, you know, if you're in even if you're into Bitcoin and you think it's digital gold, I mean, art yeah. is in the eye of the beholder. You know, That's right. I'm kind Good of point. Saying, Hey, gold, gold is triumphant. Gold is the best. But you could look at this and say, hey, Bitcoin is digital gold, you know, either way. You know, how does the OK, so how does the physical print actually get verified uh, as an ordinal? Is it a QR or an NF, NFC? What's the process? You know, that I'm not even sure. My uh, okay. partner uh, would know the answer to that question because he's the Bitcoin ordinal expert. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. I don't uh, I don't really know much right. about so, ordinals. I don't even know about them. A lot of people would look at this and say, wait a minute, this is Peter Schiff doing an ordinal. I mean, why not just uh, do, uh, you know, a gold sculpture as opposed to an actual ordinal coming off of a physical well, remember, asset? I did an actual painting. I've done actual prints. 
Okay. See, as far as I'm concerned, I'm selling That's the, the prints. Okay. Yeah, I'm selling the prints. I'm giving the ordinals away for free. They're freebie. <laughs> we'll see what happens with them. Um, right. But, you know, personally, as I've said this before, I don't think Bitcoin's going to succeed. But if I'm wrong, um, <laughs> then you're these hedging your bet. should be really valuable because <laughs> yes. I think that I'm going to go down in history if Bitcoin succeeds as the guy that was the most wrong because I'm the most well known. You're Bitcoin either going to be most wrong or most right. <laughs> right. But either way, the I think if I'm most wrong and Bitcoin is around in a thousand years, you know, these ordinals, hey, Peter Schiff, I'm the original guy that didn't get it. I'm the rich, okay. I'm the old generation that held on to his I'm the OG. and said it would never work. You know, like so I'm a, I'm a very historic figure in the evolution of Bitcoin, if it succeeds. I mean, because be. the, in the Bitcoin community, I am the number no doubt one about Bitcoin it. bear. You know? Yeah, no doubt. And, and you, so, you are the, you're the Bitcoin bear, for sure. So, you know, I think it has some value. Now, even if I'm right and it crashes, well, hey, this is the guy that got it right. Hey, it could have value for that reason, too. At a minimum, so you, the prints will have value. So you seem to be hedging on that with just by choosing Bitcoin and ordinals over Ethereum, because you could easily win Ethereum and an NFT with a smart contract with something like this. So yeah, well, you, the is, reason is because I'm, I'm more well known as a Bitcoin critic, yeah, not sure. a okay. ether critic. And, and, and so I thought it was it, it'd be more ironic to do it on the Bitcoin, on Bitcoin when I'm just constantly knocking Bitcoin. And I thought it was funny because when I first announced this on Twitter, I tweeted it out. Everybody mm -hmm. thought my account was hacked, which it wasn't. But a week <laughs> later, it actually was hacked by yeah. somebody trying to promote a, 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 a crypto scam related to gold. But there were all these stories that were written. You can see them on the Internet. Peter Schiff finally converts. We've won him over. Yep. Welcome. Oh, Peter. Yeah. Congratulations. They yeah. haven't won me over. But still, you know, they're they're waiting for my approval. Everybody in the Bitcoin community thinks that, you know, if they can only get me, they can only convince me, then that's it. They, that's, <laughs> that's the, I'm the last roadblock to hyper Bitcoinization, you know, so. Yeah. Peter, what do you make of this on? Uh, uh, you, you've, I'm sure you've been following all the, the hearings. We've had several of them on our show here around the digital asset space, what's happening there. You look at, and, and in reality, I mean, you, you kind of, in a way, somebody could say, well, wait a minute, are you selling uh, an unregistered security when you look at this? Because that's something that I think a lot of people look at art already, you know, high profile watches. There's an expectation of profit. There's not an investment contract, which is the big difference here which is the yeah, argument that I think everybody makes. Yeah, you're talking about a Howey test is what needs yep. to be put on. Mm -hmm. So the expectation of profit has to come from the efforts of a, a, a person or a group of people. And so that when you buy, let's say, um, this uh, painting and you get an mm -hmm. ordinal of the painting, I don't do anything to try to make that ordinal more valuable. You don't, you know, own a piece of a, of a business. You just own a, a, a digital, um, you know, kind of uh, um, rep ownership verification of a, of, a, yeah. of a physical product of, of a painting. Now, whether that painting goes up or down in value has nothing to do with any work that I'm going to do. I'm not, you know, I'm not promising to go out and promote that ordinal and get it to go up in value i mean you know it's just like when i sell somebody gold gold's not yeah. security it's just, i mean I, I can't i don't do anything to influence the gold market I, i'm i'm uh, on your listen so i'm yeah, on your side because, when, it, when it comes yeah. to that because i believe that just because just because somebody buys something and expects to make money doesn't make it a security they have to expect Agreed. to make money because there are other people who are promising to do something actively Mm -hmm. to generate that profit right well i and i think that's the argument that that people would make you know if you look at digital assets nfts etc which i think we're going to get to a point where finally the u.s does get some sort of legislation around this because digital assets whether it's nfts or other aspects around the world we're going to see it coming it's already mm -hmm. happening in the eu in asia we'll see more of that i think here in the u.s it's just a matter of time the the problem is is that crypto is probably holding that up because of the value of these tokens 
that often could still be argued to that point. So I, I definitely well, there agree, are a lot I think, of tokens. There are a lot of tokens that would fail the Howey test and would be for sure security. I mean, so it, sure. it just depends. And, and so if you're going to raise money to promote a business, yep, and you're going to raise money through tokens rather than a sale of stock, you mm -hmm. still have to you know comply with the security laws. That's that's it. Now. And if you don't want to comply with those laws, then you've got to raise your money in jurisdictions that don't have those kind of laws, right? Like, exactly. like the United yeah. States. But, you know, there's over 20,000 of these tokens, you know, and a lot of them, you know, would be deemed securities. The question is, are they going to, are they going to say Bitcoin is a security? You know, I mean, they'd have to stretch it to claim that, but I mean, they could try to make the case. And the way I think they would try to do it is by saying that you have all these miners that the key mm -hmm. to Bitcoin is you have to have the miners verifying the all network. the transactions, doing all the work. And so in a way, you're betting on the miners. The miners have to do a job. They're getting compensated in Bitcoin. And so if they can say the way this whole thing works, where you have a group of miners that are operating it and getting compensated, and they're helping to uh, increase the value of Bitcoin by the, 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 the functions that they're serving, you could send, you could try to say, they could make an argument, oh, we think that means it's a security. But if, if they if they can declare Bitcoin a security, it just makes it so much more difficult to use it because the security laws, and I, you know, I owned a broker no doubt. for a long time. Yeah. I mean, they're very no onerous. Doubt. Yeah, no doubt. I, I don't see that happening uh, in any way, of course, even, the, even to a certain extent, the SEC has already kind of um, validated that Bitcoin is not a security. It is... You they know, did in the past, but you know, I'm telling yeah. you, these guys can well, change. Well, things their can mind. always change, sure, with yeah. based on what we've seen coming out of DC. But I, I think the, I don't the, trust the government at all. You know. I, yeah. I, so. <laughs> hey, Peter. Listen. Good luck uh, <laughs> on uh, June 16th coming up, just around the corner, seven to nine. If you guys want to catch it out over there, Peter doesn't ask us to say this or anything, but uh, he's got his uh, his auction going up there. What are you going to do with this money? What are yeah, you gonna well, do? Do I think anything good. Are, Look, if I was a Bitcoiner, I would be buying these ordinals. I would, if I believed in Bitcoin, right? So yeah. for you guys to do, I would go to the website, right? The uh, yes. OneMarketPrice.com. OneMarketPrice.com. Yep. Take a look. You got Bitcoin anyway. These ordinals are inscribed on a Satoshi. So take, mm -hmm. take some Satoshis and get one that's actually going to be really unique because it's going to have one of 50 numbered, uh, you know, prints and you get the print if you don't come yep. down in new york we will mail you that print right with That's my cool. signature on it you can if you want you can throw darts at it you can put it up on, <laughs> on the wall I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't damage it like that maybe maybe you could put like rubber tips on them but it you might gotta, be worth you it a, a work of art it that might you be worth frame. it you can make fun of me or make fun of yourself when when bitcoin crashes but you've now got each of the order. prints each of the prints, so because like right now you're trying to get to the thirty thousand bid on the original. Uh, the each no, of the, the prints, the original. I don't know if anybody has bid on the oil painting yet because okay, that's so the these reserve. are all the prints. Okay, these are all the prints. Yeah, those are the prints. The I don't know if anyone is and, and, floor and it's price fine. looks no like seven twenty nine. Yeah, if no one buys the original, I'm just going to keep it. Right? I mean, I, okay. I, 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 you know, and that's about the thirty thousand is like what it cost me to, to have it done. So like, okay, I'm going to keep it. If someone buys it, they'll buy it. Um, but people are buying the ordinals and the prints because they're less expensive, obviously, than the original oil painting. But if you go on that website and you have a winning bid and it's going to be very simple, the top 50 bids get a print. Whoever yep. bids the most gets Print number one. I think someone's got a five thousand dollar bid for number. Yeah, one. there's a five so thousand like, for the number one. Looks like for yeah, yeah. the number one is at five thousand right now. Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of how it how it's going to work. But you'll get number your fourteen is mine. My hmm? I'm I'm going after number fourteen, just so everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, if somebody has a lucky number and they want to bid on that number. You know, I, I wonder if there'll be a lot of the Chinese that want to buy number eight. You know, that one number eight. Be, yeah. That would do it. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, Peter. that's a lucky number over there. Hey, listen, but Peter, always always, always fun having, having you on the show. Thank you so much. We appreciate yeah. it. All right. Thanks a lot. Good luck. You bet. Take care. All right. So, guys, uh, if you're tuned in right now, make sure and jump into our Diamond Circle. It's one of the best places where you'll get additional content. We do a lot of podcasts and also our audio cast. I do some 
exclusive stuff over there, both on market analysis, but more from a strategy standpoint, just in general of how tech and really how investment is going to be changing the future, I think, of a lot of people around digital assets, all that kind of stuff you can catch over there. Just click the link down below. If you want to catch me, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath. Thank <laughs> you.